team, welcome. The Northern Lights. Finding the Northern Lights is way, way up on many people's bucket lists. People travel to extreme locations like up here in the Arctic, where I'm right now in Lofoten in Norway, to see these once in a lifetime Northern Lights, the incredible power of nature shining in the Arctic sky. And there is a little bit of a trick to finding them. So today I want to share with you exactly how to put yourself in the best position to see the Northern Lights, what causes the Northern Lights, and how we can find them. Let's get straight into it. There are three things that we need for the Northern Lights, and one of them is kind of non-essential. Let's put it that way. So we'll start with that one. That one's darkness. Obviously we need it to be nighttime. We need to be able to see the contrast of the Northern Lights against the night sky. We can't see it against a sky that's daylight. But we don't necessarily need a dark area. We can see the Northern Lights with a good strong moon, even a full moon, and we can see the Northern Lights with city lights or from a well-lit area. But they have to be pretty strong for that to happen. The rest of the time we need darkness, we need dark areas. And again, it's because we need to be able to see that contrast of the Northern Lights against the sky with minimal other light entering our eyes. Because the times when we get these massive eruptions of Northern Lights, where we can see them with a full moon or we can see them against city lights, is quite rare. So number one, we need to find dark skies. But more importantly than that, we need clear skies. And so, that's all about terrestrial weather. We're going to move on to space weather as well. But let's start with this terrestrial weather. So right now, as I said, I'm in Norway. And to find my clear skies, the best method I could use is looking out this window right here. Looking out and assessing the conditions and figuring out what the cloud coverage is like. Because the northern lights occur around the polar regions, um, it's, it's, how do I put this nicely? The weather forecast is more like a weather horoscope. It's gonna give you an idea of what's likely to happen, but you cannot fully trust it like you can in some parts of the world. So, looking out the window and seeing what is going on, comparing it to the weather forecast is a good thing to do and it's a good place to start because we need to find the clear skies that we can see through the clouds or over the clouds, depending on where we are, to see the Northern Lights. When I say over the clouds, this is quite important. Clouds can be from like two, three hundred feet up to a few thousand, perhaps up to 10,000 feet in most extreme cases. That's why planes fly so high. They fly above the clouds to get away from the turbulence that they cause. So if we can see above the clouds, we can see above those couple of hundred to couple of thousand feet into the sky, all the way up to where the Northern Lights occur, which is above 70 kilometers above the Earth's surface. There's a massive difference. So if we can find an opening in the sky, and see through the opening above the clouds, we might be able to see the Northern Lights up there above it. To find these clear skies, there are global weather services and apps that we can use, such as Windy, which is an app that is quite commonly used by pilots to see global weather. But like I said, right now I'm in Norway, so I'm gonna use the local Norwegian meteorological office, and I can find them online at yr.no. If I were in Iceland, for example, I would check Veda.is, that's their local meteorological office. Different meteorological office for each country, of course. So then we've got different ones for Finland, Sweden, the Faroe Islands, Canada. We've got all these other places where we can see the Northern Lights at polar latitudes. Now, we don't have to be at polar latitudes. We can see the Northern Lights quite far down. Three nights ago, the northern lights that I saw here were also visible in Denmark. I've seen pictures from Denmark from three nights ago. That's just how crazy strong they can be. And what's important to remember on that is that we're currently approaching uh, solar maximum. We're going towards the start of a new solar cycle, which lasts approximately 11 years. And these solar cycles are announced by NASA. It's a period of high activity on the sun. It goes up and down, up and down over the course of this 11 years from peak down and then back up again. As we're approaching this maximum, we're getting up until about 2025, when I'm expecting NASA is going to announce that we've hit solar maximum, we're gonna get some very, very strong Northern Lights shows. So if you wanna see them, now is the best time. 
But what about the Aurora itself, the Space Weather? How do we figure that out? I use Space Weather Live. It's an app. It's also available at spaceweatherlive.com. And the data that comes from there is also interpreted by other apps such as Aurora, Aurora Alerts, Aurora Watch UK. There are several apps that we can use that interpret the data for us and give us a nice simple indicator of whether the Northern Lights are likely to appear. Now, I'm gonna first point out that I keep hearing people talking about the KP scale and the KP level. That doesn't tell you the likelihood of the Northern Lights appearing. What that tells you is, if the Northern Lights appear, where are they going to appear? What latitude? KP zero, far, far north. And we're talking about up by Svalbard, Longyearbyen, that kind of a latitude. Right now, to have Northern Lights overhead here in the Foden, it needs to be on a KP four. That's the level at which they appear, and it's hard to forecast it. So when you see KP levels, don't take that as gospel because I've seen loads of times we have forecasts of KP1, KP2, but I've actually seen them on the KP6, KP7 line where they've been immensely strong and even appeared as a G1 or G2 geomagnetic solar storm. So moving away from KP, what the Northern Lights actually are is, in a very condensed version is this. Here is the Earth, here is the Sun. We're orbiting around the Sun and the Sun is a big ball of gas. It's helium and hydrogen gas, and it's burning. And it's burning so hot that it's actually not gas anymore. It's actually a fourth state of matter. It's plasma. And so as we orbit it, some of this plasma comes and hits us. We'll get onto how that happens, but first let's talk about the magnetic fields because this is incredibly important to both the sun and the earth in terms of how the Northern Lights appear and when they're likely to appear. Over on the earth, we have a huge iron core and that iron core is extremely dense and therefore we have gravity on the earth and we have a very sort of controlled and regulated magnetosphere. The earth has a magnetic field and it's very consistent. It's moving really slowly, but it is very consistent overall. Whereas over on the sun, this big ball of plasma, there is no core like we have on the earth. And so the magnetic fields are actually all over the surface. There are hundreds of magnetic fields interacting all over the sun, inside and on the surface. And so there's positives and negative, and we remember from school about magnets and how they work, and the positives and negatives pushing and repelling each other, and all of that sort of stuff. Well, when it happens on the Earth, it simply goes around one to the other, around one to the other, it's the, that's the magnetic field. Over on the sun, because it's pushing all over the place, and it's so volatile and there's so many chemical reactions, in fact, nuclear reactions taking place to keep that big ball of plasma burning. These positives that approach each other have nowhere to go. They can't go inwards, they go outwards from the surface and they form arcs on the surface of the sun. And those arcs build up so much energy that they quite often snap. And these are called coronal mass ejections where they snap and all that plasma, which is way bigger in terms of mass than the mass of the Earth, flies off into space. And it could go that way, it could go this way, it could go anywhere. But some of it comes straight to us. When this plasma enters our magnetic field, it gets pulled into the poles repelled from the equator. All that plasma hits the gases in our atmosphere. Sometimes that's visible, not all the time. So we can have these things happen but certain conditions aren't present. Like the BT level can be too high. The density can be too low. The speed can be too fast. And we won't be able to see what's happening when these gases, these, this plasma from the sun comes in and hits our gas in our atmosphere. But when it does, oh boy, it's good. So we can forecast about an hour ahead in most cases when that's gonna happen because there's a satellite in space called Discover, which is where all the data on Space Weather Live comes from. It literally has a bucket. When the plasma hits the bucket, this bucket's measuring how much of it there is, how dense it is, what its charge is, what the speed is. It's measuring all this stuff. And we know that the bit that goes past the bucket has this information, the speed, the density, and all of this good stuff. This tells us whether the Northern Lights are likely to appear within the next hour or so. 
based on the speed of that plasma and how fast it's flying through space and into our magnetic field. As it gets pulled into our poles, into the polar regions at the North and Pole and South Pole, this plasma hits the gases in our atmosphere and there's a massive energy exchange. This energy exchange has um, got to release some energy in some form and the way it does that is in the form of light. And therefore, as that plasma, helium, hits, a, a, let's say, an oxygen particle, it's going to emit some green light. If it's hitting oxygen at higher altitudes, it's emitting red light. If it's hitting nitrogen in our atmosphere, it's emitting blue light. Think of it like, um, you know those neon lights you get in the bars? Think of it like that. It's very much the same principle, that there's a charge going through a gas inside a tube that illuminates a certain color based on what the gas is. This charged plasma hits that gas in our upper atmosphere. It emits the color of light that corresponds to the gas particles that it's colliding with and having an energy exchange with. So as I said, it, it depends on many factors whether we see the Northern Lights or not. Um, and it's, it's, there are things about this that we know an awful lot about, but there are some elements to the Northern Lights that we just don't know anything about yet. Um, there are government agencies and space agencies still working on figuring out exactly what's going on up there, but based on the information that we do know, Here's what we need to look out for. The BZ, which is usually the bottom graph on Space Weather Live, will give us a figure in a positive or a negative. In order to see the Northern Lights, we need that figure to be negative. It's like a magnet, a North Pole attracting a South. We need the North Pole to attract that negative, that South, in order for the energy to come in through the uh, atmosphere and to illuminate as the Northern Lights. But on top of that, there's another figure, BT. This is very important. The BT is like the stretch, the stretch of the magnetism. So when you see all these ovals in the sky, these arcs, at a low value, somewhere between zero and four on the BT scale will give us these arcs. Anything higher than that, and it snaps. The, the, the magnetism essentially snaps in space and the energy could be anywhere. And it gives us other things like the curtains or the pillars of the Northern Lights, even those big swirls we see in the sky. This is where the BT is high, higher than number four on the scale. The density parts per centimeter cubed of helium coming in towards us also makes a difference. The denser it is, the more Northern Lights we're gonna see in terms of the quantity, think of it in terms of the quantity or the thickness of the Northern Lights we see up there. So the more parts per centimeter cubed, the thicker the Northern Lights are going to be. And then on top of that, the last one, which is usually the very top one on the Space Weather Live, is the speed. It can be anywhere from 300 to about 800 kilometers per second. These are ridiculous breakneck speeds that this stuff is flying through space at. If it's a low speed, we'd get less activity. It's all slow, makes perfect sense. But if we get high speeds, when this plasma flies in through our atmosphere down towards the surface, we get an extension of the Northern Lights. They come further south. And that's when we get whites and pinks up in the sky because it's flying so fast and coming so low. It's interacting with gases at different levels, different densities in the atmosphere that it gives us these better pink colors and aquamarine and all these beautiful colors, the Northern Lights will then be closer to us as well. So they can be up to 200 kilometers above our heads, which is insane to think about, like 140 miles above our heads, above the surface of the Earth. But when it's really fast and we get these pinks, aquamarines and whites, it's really low. It's about 70 kilometers, about 45 miles above our heads. And so it feels closer and we see so much more of the movement as well as it goes across the sky. But that's another thing. Why is it happening there? Why is it happening in the specific locations that it's happening in? Well, that's because of our magnetic field. This is another thing we have access to, to see the measurements of. So just like we want the interplanetary magnetic field, which is shown as BZ, to be negative, we want our Earth's magnetic field to be negative. And we can check the data from magnetometers all over the north, in Canada, Alaska, in Greenland, in the northern United States, um, 
Iceland, down the road in Kiruna, another one up the road in Tromsø, the Svalbard in Longyearby, and these things are everywhere. And we can look at the magnetometers, and if we see that they are showing some motion, particularly southwards motion, then that can give us an indication that the Northern Lights are active in that location and along that line of magnetism around the Earth. And this is all some crazy stuff that if you really are interested in, it's kind of captivating and it's, it's like a science all in itself. But if you don't want to understand all of this and you just simply want to see the Northern Lights, my strongest recommendation to you is to book an expert local guide, not a bus tour, a local guide, someone that knows the area. Because if you remember back to the first thing I said about clear, dark skies, the local guides will understand local weather systems and weather patterns and, and have smaller vehicles that can park in harder to access places where you'll have a greater chance of seeing the Northern Lights. And this is on your bucket list for a reason. It's incredible. Once you've seen it, you can't get enough of it. The, the feeling is insane. When you see an incredible demonstration of the Northern Lights, particularly when you get a G1 or G2 storm, let's quickly cover that actually. Here's the sun, here's the earth. All the plasma comes and hits us. That's not the end of it. Some of it goes past us. and Our gravitational field slows it down and it gets to a point where it stops and hovers in space and it bunches up. So we've got some of it over here coming and hitting us. But when this builds up so strong in our magneto tail behind the earth from the sun, that snaps and comes into the earth as well. So we're getting bombarded from two angles and we can get a G1 or a G2 geomagnetic storm. And that's when we get those insanely powerful light shows. But yes, the Northern Lights, high on bucket list for a very good reason. They are so, so impressive. I urge you, if you haven't, to try and find them. And if you find this useful, please let me know. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback and I'd love to know if you found the Northern Lights. If you have any questions, you can fire them at me, no problem whatsoever. And if you want to know a lot more information, I have written a book called The Complete Aurora Guide for Travelers and Photographers, which is available on Amazon. And I would love to know how you get on. So here is my Instagram. Please feel free to tag me and show me your Northern Lights images when you get into the Arctic and see them for yourselves. Do not hesitate to send me any questions you may have. Thank you very much for watching. See you in another video.